Morning, everybody. Hey, great to see everybody on. Can I just get thumbs up that the audio is clear and that everybody can see me? So just some thumbs up, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm just waiting for some thumbs up to make sure that everything is good to go. Yep, great. Thanks, Tarek. Thanks for letting me know. Great, Leanne. Awesome. Okay. Great. So we'll make a start. Good morning. Happy 1st of April to everybody. Thank you so, so much for joining us, me and uh, Clive. Thank you for uh, putting this great event on. Clive, thank you for asking me to do a presentation. And today I'm hoping to cover pterygoid implants. Uh, so we're going to make a quick start and I'll just go into my slides. Okay, great. So we're going to be talking about maximizing AP spread with pterygoid implants and this event's been kindly sponsored by BioHorizons Camlog. Before we start, this is a free webinar, but what we're asking is for you guys to make a small donation to the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice. And there will be a link for a donate button on the side coming up. So whatever, anything that you can give, that'd be greatly appreciated. Okay, so a little bit about me. I'm just going to make my picture a little bit smaller. Okay, so a little bit about me. I've been a dentist for uh, over 15 years and then in that 15 years I've also studied medicine. I left medical training in 2014 and have primarily focused on surgical dentistry and then for the last five to six years my primary focus has been on implants and presently I am a peripatetic implant dentist. I travel from as north as Oban and as south as London, a teaching, mentoring and placing implants. So that's that's me. This is a, just some of the aims of, and objectives of today's webinar. I'm not going to go through the aims and objectives, but there's three things that I'd love for each one of you to get out of today. One, what is a pterygoid implant? Two, in which clinical situation would we be looking to place pterygoid implants? Three, the surgical steps involved. So if we can get these three things, then I'm happy uh, that I've got across what I really wanted to during this webinar. And at the end, I'll illustrate some of my own clinical cases. Okay, so before I go into the, the sort of uh, the nitty gritty of pterygoid implants, what I'd like to do is just set the scene and talk about edentulism and how big a problem it is around the world. Also, note, although today the focus of the webinar will be on pterygoid implants in relation to full arch implant treatment, pterygoid implants can be used and utilised for short spans to avoid sinus lifts, and I'll go into that later. But specifically today, I'll be talking more of a focus on full arch. So this statement, edentulism is a chronic disease associated with significant rates of morbidity and health issues. I hope that we would all be in agreement that this is the case. The WHO estimate that there's 300 million people around the world with either one or both jaws with no teeth. How about closer to home? So I'm based up in Scotland, but let's look at some UK figures. In Europe, 40 to 50% of the European population will be over 65 by 2015. So it's a growing problem. In the UK, 6 million estimated people that do not have any teeth in either the maxilla or the mandible. Closer to home, in Scotland, 4% of men, 5% of women aged between 16 and 64 have no natural teeth. It's a big problem. There's a lot of work for all of us. We know that there's only a marginal improvement in the quality of life for patients with complete dentures. 
and we know if we're able to deliver patients with an implant retained restoration, then we can improve the quality of life substantially. So, reasons why we're looking to, to give patients their speech back or the ability to speak properly because the teeth are essential for that. Aesthetics. So when we smile, we want to look good. Function, really a, another crucial, uh, important point of having your teeth. We need to be able to chew our food adequately to then deliver that food into our stomach so it can be digested. Self-esteem. We've all come across patients that are low in mood and it's often subsequent to their, their dentition, the lack of teeth or uh, uh, sort of a, they, they've let their teeth a, a debilitate. I just want to bring out this image, really important. I use it a lot in my teaching. This is an image uh, that Ed Pedrosian uh, has uh, documented, and he zones the maxilla into zones one, two, and three. So it's really important, one, in terms of communication with other colleagues, and two, for our treatment planning when it comes to full arch. So Ed Pedrosian talks about zoning the maxilla into zones one, two, and three. And when he talks about zone one, he's talking about bone in the incisal region, so canine to canine. Zone two is the premolar region, and zone three is the molar region, so zones one, two, and three. Okay, so really important to be aware of this illustration uh, from Ed Pedrosian. Another really useful tool to utilize is the Kwood and Howe classification from 1988. So these two surgeons from Chester in England they got 200 skeletons and they analysed them and they documented the resorption part and they came up with a scale from one to six. And what we're focusing on when we're talking about atrophy and a de degradation of the bone over time is scale three, four, uh, sorry, four, five and six. So when we talk about an atrophic maxilla, we're referring to a scale of four, five, and six. So Kewood Howell, four, five, and six. And there's a scale for the anterior maxilla, posterior maxilla, and the anterior mandible, and also the posterior uh, mandible. So another useful tool to communicate with colleagues when you're discussing treatments, etc. Right, so let's look at some, some overall some just some graphless solutions when it comes to full arch patients. Now, if we have bone available in zones one, two, and three, then there's, there's, there's no issue. We can place six axial implants, put on straight multi-units, and give the patient a full arch restoration. And that's, that's ideal, but it, we all know that's not the case. That's hard. These patients are rare. We often have patients that have pneumatized sinuses uh, that we have to deal with. But in an ideal world, We'd have plenty of bone under the sinuses and we'd place straight implants and we'd place straight multi-units because a straight multi-unit is preferred to an angle. A couple of reasons. It's a stronger connection with a straight multi-unit and with an angled multi-unit, what we're doing is eating into that crucial restorative space. So, if, so again, if we have bone in zones one, two and three, all along from incisors to molars, we're placing straight implants. Now, if we have bones only in zones one and two, what are we doing? Well, we could go through the conventional grafting approach, do sinus lifts and place six implants, or we could do the all on four approach where we place two implants in the lateral sites and then two angled implants to avoid the sinuses. Now, what do we do if we've only got bone in zones one? Then we need to utilize extra maxillary implants or go down the grafting approach and but that has its own issues. So if we only have bone in zones one, then we need to either utilize zygomatic, pterygoid or, or nasalis or trans sinus implants in combination with axial implants. Now, if there's total loss of bone, so a Kwood and Howell class five and six, when you write down to basal bone, then that's a case that we'd be, I'd be looking to place quad zygomas. So for the purpose of this webinar, what we're going to be focusing on is patients with bone available in zones one and two and bone available only in zone one, because these are the patients that I'd be looking 
to potentially place pterygoid implants. So what is a pterygoid implant? Well, the, the definition in the dictionary states it's an implant placement through the maxillary tuberosity and into the pterygoid plate. And it was first described by Telazny in 1989. So it's been around for a long, long time. So just to give some context, the zygoma implant was, was invented by Branimart in 1988. So zy zygomatic implants and pterygoid implants have really been around for roughly the same time. So the implant placement is through the tuberosity to the palatal parabital process of the pterygoid uh, plate. And what we're doing there is going through D4 type bone and then engaging bone that is D1 and D or D2. So we're going through soft bone and engaging bone that's harder. And that's where we can get good stability of our, of our implant. So what's the rationale? So what's the thinking? What kind of patients are we looking to place these implants in and why? So one of the real benefits of placing a pterygoid implant is we're avoiding the sinus and we can maximize the AP spread and avoid cantilevers. We all know in full arch, the most commonly the common implant that is likely to fail is often the distal implant, the implant that's angled to avoid the sinus because the bone is often of poor quality in that region. Uh, so what we can do is avoid having a cantilever on our prosthesis by placing a pterygoid implant, so an implant further back, so there's no distal cantilever. With, if, if, we, if we have a distal cantilever, we are potentially doubling the load on the distal implant, and, and we want to really try to avoid that. It's important in wide smile cases when patients, some patients smile, have a really wide smile, then they potentially show up towards the first molar and sometimes up towards the second molar. And when we're restoring these patients, then they may not want to see a gap that far back. What's the option? A sinus lift, place an implant, or we could place a pterygoid implant and give the patient teeth all the way back. One a real benefit of a pterygoid implants is placing pterygoids and when you really refine the technique, we can get high torque, so high insertion torque, 40, 50 plus newtons centimetres when we place the pterygoid implants. That allows us to immediately load, which is a great benefit. So let's, let's talk about a scenario. What if the when you're placing your implant in an all, let's say it's an all in four approach, the distal implant to avoid the sinus, you don't get the, the torque that you're looking for. So for me, I have a particular protocol. I aim for torque at least 40 to 45 newtons. What if I only got 20? Well, I have an option. I could place a pterygoid implant, get high torque with that, and then link all the implants together. And so I'd be more comfortable immediately loading if I have an implant in front and behind uh, the, an implant that has low torque. So, you know, a real benefit of pterygoid implants, we can get high torque and then we can also immediately load. Also, one great advantage of pterygoid implants in comparison to zygoma implants is that the prosthetic outcomes are better, but that is certainly dependent on the technique uh, of a uh, technique that you utilize to place zygoma implants. Traditionally, they were very palatal, so, uh, but more and more we've become aware of that and we're certainly moving more towards uh, a more restoratively driven uh, surgical approach when it comes to zygomas as well. But uh, generally, we can get better prosthetic outcomes with pterygoids compared to zygomatics. It's an alternative to doing a sinus lift and zygomatic implants, you know, so I'm not saying we're not doing a sinus lift. I'm, I'm saying pterygoid implants is an alternative to a lateral sinus lift. And we know that we get equivalent uh, success rates uh, as a, in comparison to conventional implants. Uh, of 96% and there's there's data and the literature supporting that.
Okay, now, so let's just uh, go over some of the surgical uh, aspects. Something I heard uh, earlier on when I was learning pterygoids, a colleague described this It's simple surgery, but it's in a complex territory. So pterygoid implants, for me, I'm a big believer in it, is simple surgery in a complex territory. So we really need to be appreciative of the anatomy because it is a blind technique to a degree. So, and so clinical differences in the anatomy can occur. So please note that not every patient is suitable for pterygoid implants. And I'll go on and I'll, I'll shoot. I'll show you radiographically and clinically what we look for uh, to get the ideal scenario for, for placing pterygoid implants. But differences exist between patients because not everybody has enough of a tuberosity to allow you to engage the plate. All patients have a pterygoid plate, unless there's been some trauma uh, in the past, but not everybody has adequate uh, bone in the tuberosity because often the, the maxillary sinus can pneumatize up towards and as far back as the tuberosity and you just don't have enough bone to allow the implant to pass through. Access is critical. So when I assess my patients for full large treatment, I will always document mouth opening and ideally you want at least 45 millimetres, but ideally 50 millimetres of mouth opening because access is crucial. You need the access to visualise and, uh, and for the drills and for the implant placement, so important. Implant design and length, again, really impro uh, important. I, I use a BioHorizons internal tapered implants. Uh, I have just other implants for, the t for placing pterygoids, but I'll go on to talk about why I feel that this implant is designed ideally, to, ideally for this, a, a, you know, pl placement of an implant in the pterygoid bone. And length, you need an implant in the region of 15 to 18. So 95% of the implants that are placed in the pterygoid region are 15 millimetres, about 5% are 18. I've never placed a smaller than a, a, t a 15 in the, in the pterygoid region. A you want an implant with a good prosthetic connection and flexibility. So what I'm referring to here is the BioHorizons implant is a Zimmer connection, it's a hex. And most implant companies that, that offer full arch solutions will have a straight multi-unit, a 17 and a 30 degree. The beauty of the Zimmer connection is that I can outsource and, and get a specific companies to, to that make a 45 and a 60 degree uh, angle corrected multi-unit. So I have that flexibility and I have that flexibility because it's a Zimmer connection. Your positioning is really important when you're uh, carrying out the surgery. My positioning when I place a, a pterygoid implant on the right side is different to when I place a pterygoid on the left side. Also, I use a different hand piece when I place a right pterygoid as opposed to the left pterygoid, I'll swap hand pieces and I'll, I'll, I'll go on to that uh, in a little bit. So let's just look over some of the anatomy uh, and the relevance. So this is the re region that we're focusing on, the tuberosity and I marked it with a red circle, but what's really important is this area here, the greater and the lesser palatine foramen where the vessels come out. Now, when we make the incision, it's usually slightly buckled. The tissue is quite thick and adherent. The bone is soft, so you have to carefully push the flap over. And your assistant and yourself need to be careful that you don't compress or traumatise this area because there's a potential for a serious bleed. So really, really careful and be aware of the anatomy, the greater and lesser palatine. One, your assistant, you need to be careful that they are not traumatizing or pressing on this area and yourself you need to just be careful that you are not going to traumatize it when you sort of push over uh, the flap uh, but you need good access okay again this is another view so again just this is the area here that we're focusing on the implant we start about this region so if that's an eight just at the distal aspect of the eight and angle backwards it's it's we're angling palatally 
so backwards. So if this is the, the lateral pterygoid plate, we're aiming between the two plates. Uh, and this is a really, really important figure. Research tells us that from this point up to here, so 20 to 25 millimetres, above from 20 to 25 millimeters above this point is where the pterygoid plexus is so from here to here anywhere between 20 to 25 is where the pterygoid plexus and that's the danger zone that's the zone that we need to avoid so if we stick to implants that are 15 or 18 millimeters in length and remember i said 95% of the pterygoids I place are 15. I'm way, way away from this danger zone. And one of the, when I go on to talk about complications, one of the documented complications of pterygoid implants is a potential bleed. Then, uh, you know, if I stick to a 15, then I'm nowhere near that danger zone. So really important to know. And so that's why, I, you know, when we teach this and when I carry out these pterygoid implants, I really am sticking to... Uh, at 15 or an 18 millimeter that's because of this danger zone okay so let's just look at this uh, slice of a cbct scan and and i want to i would like to illustrate what is it that i'm looking for when i assess uh, the radio radiological images to make me confident that i'm you know happy to place an implant so really you want a a one centimeter, one centimeter squared of a bone in the tuberosity region, and that's because the implant needs to tr transverse through here up towards the pterygoid plate. Right, someone's just uh, pointed out that they can't see me, the pointer. I apologise. Uh, so if you can just, I'll, I'll try to be a bit more descriptive. So if I'm at the distal of this last standing tooth, then I'm looking to... Uh, thanks, someone's popped on the whiteboard. Okay, good. So what I'm doing, that angle. Okay, so what I want to be doing is making sure that I'm surrounded by bone all around this that's what, how my implant's going to transverse. Okay, so I'll just clear this now. Great, okay. Was that clear for everybody? If we get thumbs up. So we need, we need that adequate volume of bone in the tuberosity. Thumbs up if that was visible to everybody. Yeah, I know we can't see my pointer, but Okay, great, great, okay. So if I'm going to point, I'll bring up the whiteboard. Equipment is really important. It makes your job so much easier if you have the right equipment. And I will show you just the different types of hand pieces that I use, depending on if I'm doing a right or a left pterygoid. I'm a big fan of the Versa drills. Actually, it's the only drills I'll use really when I do a pterygoid implant, unless for some reason I didn't have them. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a real believer in them, especially because I'm able to identify the soft bone in that region. I like really like to use a, a surgical hand driver as well, and I'm a real fan of the Anthogear Universal Hand Torque Wrench. So I've got some images of that. Of that. So in the top left, we've got the Anthogear, which is great for access working so far back in the mouth you know working really far back in the mouth because one of the real risks is that you could potentially drop a multi-unit or or a cover screw into the patient's throat so really need to be aware of that and be pre protecting the patient's airway and one way of avoid you know sort of is keeping safe is using a, a device such as an Anthogear. There are others on the market. Then going across uh, were the Versa drills. Now the, the Versa drills are absolutely fantastic. The, the Lance bar in that kit is great. It's, it's about, I think it's about 20 millimeters in length, which is really ideal for, uh, in terms of a length for, for placing these pterygoids. And then I will commonly use the two 
<coughs> excuse me, the two, the two point three or the two point five, uh, to full depth, and then just open up the top of the osteotomy with maybe the three millimeter. Excuse me. So this hand piece, bought. This is my go-to handpiece when I do my pterygoids on the right side. So for the right side, the handpiece that you can see illustrated is the handpiece that I will use doing the right pterygoid. It so much makes the placement so much easier than, than using a contra-angle. Now when I do a pterygoid on the left side, I use a contra-angle. Now, please note, I'm right-handed, so some colleagues are ambidextrous, lucky. Uh, but if you're right-handed, I would use that handpiece that you can see in the bottom left to do a right pterygoid. And when I do a left pterygoid, I use a contra-angle. And then, <coughs> excuse me, really useful to have the surgical hand driver to, to, to get a feel of the implant as it's going in. And uh, to, just, to just put it down to the, the right depth. So the, these are four essential equipment, four essential pieces of equipment that are uh, make placement of pterygoid implants so much easier. Now, let's have a look at these three implants from BioHorizons. And there's, there's really been an evolution in the design since I've started doing uh, full arch and pterygoid implants. And uh, that's really due to design changes by BioHorizons. So in the far left, we've got a 3.8 diameter implant. And it comes with a three-in-one abutment. That's one of the huge benefits of using the BioHorizons implants. They come with a carrier. And what I would say is really is crucial to be using an implant with a carrier. Because when we go into the complications, you'll understand why. So the, th the 3.8 from BioHorizons internal tapered implant can can come with a carrier. It can also come without a carrier. But I will always insist in placing these implants with a carrier on. But I'll go into more more about that. So, so the image on the left is a 3.8 by 15 a BioHorizons internal taper. Then we've moved across in the last sort of 18 months. BioHorizons have released a taper pro implant. So this is what this is the image in the in the middle. It's a 4.2. It's got a 3.5 platform. And what they've done is made the threads more aggressive, which allows us to get higher stability uh, when placing, especially useful in full arch. And then more recently, we've got a site-specific implant. So on the far right image is the pterygoid implant. And if you look through the images, what we've done is make a much more tapered design. And what that allows is for us to get higher torque and minimize the amount of drilling that needs to be carried out. So the pterygoid implant on the far right is a 4.2 with a 3.5 platform, more of a uh, exaggerated taper, and distinct difference between the pterygoid and the other implants. The apical diameter, which is really important, especially when we do full arch, to get bicortical sta bi bi cortical stabilization, is that the difference in apical diameter between the two. So the, the implants on the left are 2.8 in diameter apically. But this pterygoid implant is a 2.2. All right. So the, here's a, the taper pro, which is the, the implant that in the previous slide was in the middle. And it's an aggressive a pitch, self-tapping, and it's platform switched. Okay, and here's a little bit about the new pterygoid implant, which, as I said, has an aggressive taper and as I indicated and have highlighted on this slide, the apical diameter is 2.2. So how does that change my drilling protocol? So traditionally when I would place a pterygoid implant, I would start with my lance bar, then I would go to the Versa 
two millimeters and I would break through the pterygoid plate. Then I would go to the 2.3 to depth, then I would go to the 2.5. And then I would open up just the top of the osteotomy with maybe a three or a 3.2 and drill and, and then place the implant. What the pterygoid implant allows me to do is skip some of the drilling sequence because I don't, I, I don't need uh, the, the, ape, the apex of the osteotomy to be as wide as 2.5 because the implant is only 2.2. So it reduces the amount of drills that I need to use. And I found that I get really good torque values, high torque values when I utilise uh, this implant. And actually I've used this implant in a, not only the pterygoid region, but actually in the interior maxilla as well. Okay, so here are some images a, on, on a plastic model as I talk through the drilling sequence. So on the top left image, the first drill is the lance. So I don't like to use the conventional lance, as I said, I either like to use the Versa lance or some other systems have some really good longer lance burrs, but it needs to be sharp. And what we find is that we're able to push through the bone in the tuberosity because it's soft D4 quality. Often we're able to push through and then we would often engage harder bone. And that's the bone that we really want to be drilling into. So you initially just push through and we're at the kind of eight region, or the distal of the seven, angling palatally at an angle of 45 to 50 degrees. And we try to push down and try to feel some of the hard bone and then only then when we feel the hard bone do we press our foot on the pedal and try to pierce through so as we move along to the images to the right you can see with the lance bar i will always look to pierce through the pterygoid plate and if you look closely at that image in the in the top row of images in the middle you can just see that that bar has pierced through that's what I want. And you, you get some feedback and that's what I'm looking for. So uh, the, the lance bar sinks in, then it's hard, then I'll foot on the pedal and it sinks in and I draw back. What you don't want to do is just keep going. Really dangerous. The lance bar is usually thin and what you do not want to do is potentially risk breaking that because you're not getting that out. Uh, or if you keep going, you, all you're going to do is traumatise the muscle. It's not unusual to get a bit of a bleed because remember we've got the pterygoid muscles back there, they're highly vascular and you often get a, some bleeding, really a, quite a bit of bleeding more than, a, than doing a, an osteotomy elsewhere. Then we move along and we, we go up the, the drill sequence. And if you look at the bottom right of the image, the bottom right image, you can see how much of the implant we are looking to place through the pterygoid plate. So it's just one to two millimeters. You just want to engage that hard bone and that engagement of the hard bone will give you the high torque value. Okay, and you can just see that in the bottom right. Good, then, you know, then you, you can decide you can either put, if you get good enough torque, you can place a multi-unit. Usually it's a 30 degree multi-unit to angle correct. You can place it at that time or you can just place a cover screw and bury. So if I get good torque, if I get good torque with my pterygoid implants, then I'll, I will often just place them that multi-unit, uh, the, the multi-unit that I plan to use at that time of surgery. Uh, and if I need, I can then use it to uh, add it on onto my provisional, but more often than not, I just, uh, utilize the the four implants anteriorly for my provisional and I only utilize the pterygoid implant in my <coughs> excuse me <coughs> in my uh, final prosthesis okay so before I go on to the complications I'm going to go and mute and I'm going to put up two videos uh, one is me placing a pterygoid implant and the other is me drilling and just preparing the osteotomy on the left side. So I'm going to go and mute 
and I'm just going to have a look through the chat, etc. So just to add that when it goes from one video to the next, there's a short delay. So just bear with me, but you'll see two videos and then I'll come back on. Good. Okay. Can you just take a video of the talk? everybody just let me know was that clear everybody w was able to see the videos and it makes it was clear to them what i was trying to illustrate so if you look if the, so the first video i used a contra angle handpiece i was on the left side and i was using my versa drills and uh, something else to note is that i will often place the pterygoid implants first before i start taking out other teeth so place the I'll numb up the patient just in the pterygoid region, raise my flap, place the implant, close up, and then I'll I'll move on and numb up the rest of the mouth, etc. So I do I do my surgery very much staged. I, I'll place the right pterygoid, then the left pterygoid, and I'm very particular in sticking to that sequence, and I I, I don't digress. And the the second image you you saw me. Play, actually placing the implant fixture. So the right pterygoid was going in, it was a biohorizons. That particular implant was a 3.8 by 15, and you saw that gold three in a one abutment. And, and that video, I feel, nicely illustrates how you can get good torque. So it torqued out at 42 newtons, and after I would then take off the handpiece and I would use the surgical hand driver just to, just to, uh, seat that implant into the sort of the correct uh, position into the bone that I'd like and uh, the torque would only be going higher uh, after I've uh, done that and then I'd take off that three in one abutment uh, but you can certainly get a uh, really good uh, torque values with pterygoid implants allowing you to utilize them for immediate load okay so let's go on to complications complications documented there are in the literature in the past you know people were when they were sort of uh, experimenting in essence many many years ago some of the real uh, surgeons that really developed this as a, a technique used to place much longer implants into the pterygoid region and they came across a uh, significant bleeds and that's because they were placing implants longer than 20 to 25 millimeters and they were hitting a uh, really sort of crucial uh, vessels in that region and there is documented cases of uh, bleeds so if you stick to implants that are either 15 or maximum 80 millimeters we should hopefully avoid that there's a real risk of losing an implant into the maxillary sinus up until four weeks ago i had never done that but four weeks ago placing a pterygoid implant in the left hand side i inadvertently pushed it into the sinus and I absolutely bricked it because I thought I'd actually put it into the infratemporal fossa 
but it, it was okay. It was just into the sinus, no big deal, made a window and, and took it out. But that's the big worry when you do these uh, uh, telegoid implants that there's a risk of placing, of pushing the implant into the infratemporal fossa and that really is a uh, serious stuff because to get that out, you know, that, that's not going to be easy and really that's probably going to be a, refer a, a referral to MaxFax, etc. So hence, I'm really sort of push home when I say using an implant system that allows you to use a carrier uh, for safety. So if, 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 if you feel you're losing the implant, if you've lost stability, you can, you can, you've got something to grab onto to pull the implant out. So losing an implant to the maxillary sinus is a potential and that's because I probably misjudged the amount of bone in the tuberosity region. The bone quality wasn't great and probably my technique uh, was incorrect. Uh, but hey ho, uh, complications happen if you do something enough. Uh, we'll all come across them, it's just important to deal with them. But what I do want to avoid at all costs is losing an implant to the infratemporal fossa. Another complication is what happens and has happened many a time with myself is if if you're over prep or, or under prep and, and try to drive an implant in or have misjudged your angulation, there's a real risk of fracturing the tuberosity or fracturing the plate off. Really, no real harm if you pick that up. All you do is just abandon the procedure, close up, and you can potentially go back to it at another date or uh you know a uh, just you, you know just leave it leave it leave it be so a uh, fractured plate or a fractured uh, tuberosity especially when i was doing this initially and learning this procedure it happened quite commonly what i would say it took me maybe 12 to 18 you know placements before i started to really build up my confidence in placing pterygoid implants so yeah simple simple surgery but complex territory but it, it's certainly a technique and it's very much uh, a blind uh, technique and, it, and it's, it, a lot of it is feel. Okay. Any questions about the complications? Because I think we're going to go on to some clinical cases next. Okay. I've got some questions here. I, I will go through them. I know people are uh, popping up some questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Okay. So... Before we go into case, here, here's a, an illustration of a pterygoid implant that's been pushed too far in. So not ideal at all. Most of the implant is past the pterygoid plate uh, and there's a real risk that you're going to then uh, push that implant into the infradental fossa and that's not ideal. So although that's just on a model. Okay. So I've got five keys that I feel that are crucial to achieving success with pterygoid implants. So patient selection, really important. I, you know, from a clinical radiologic, clinically uh, deciding which patients need pterygoid implants and why you're going to be placing them. And from a radiological assessment point of view, access is crucial. You know, you need to have good mouth opening. Having the right equipment available just makes it so much easier. Uh, using an implant system and design that allows you to, you know, get good uh, uh, high torque and as a tapered uh, design is certainly a huge advantage. And again, technique, a safe technique where we're only placing implants that are 15 to 80 millimetres in length and very much uh, developing your technique and that feedback so you're aware when you're going through tuberosity and then when you're starting to engage uh, the D1, D2 bone of the t of the pterygoid plates as they fuse. I've got a model here and what I'll do is I will make my image a bit bigger so you can all see. So, and so, oh, you can all see that. So here's the tuberosity and there's the lateral pterygoid, the medial pterygoid. And what we're doing is aiming in between the plates or what we can do is aim towards the medial plate and the beauty of aiming towards the medial plate is that there's a, a joining of 
uh, cortical plates in that region and if you're able to engage the apex of the implant you can get really high torque. Okay, good. Okay, so just some clinical cases. I'm going to make my image a bit smaller. Okay, so first patient. So I've got two cases to go through and then some other uh, radiographs to go through. So the first patient, 57 year old, she's fit and well. She's unhappy with the appearance of her teeth. And as you'll see from the image, she's very missing teeth and she wanted a full arch solution. So that here's this lady, a high smile line, uh, you know, and I think we can all agree that a clearance was justified. So I've got some images. This was the image that I put up earlier when I showed an image of me assessing the the radiograph uh, of the tuberosity. So here we go. So we've got bone in zones one and two, and we've also got adequate bone in the tuberosity region for me to place pterygoid implants. And here we go. So day of surgery, we immediately loaded just on the front four implants and we placed two pterygoids. We placed two pterygoid implants for this lady. The clinical justification was she has a wide smile and I've got images coming up to highlight that. So immediately loaded, cover screws on, and two pterygoids because ideally I wanted to avoid any distal cantilever and she has a wide smile. Now, some of you may notice that the left pterygoid looks slightly different to the right pterygoid. Now, that's because the left pterygoid, I'd attempted to place it the conventional way, but I had to do a rescue procedure where it's slightly different, but I don't want to go into that. So that's why there's a slight difference between the, the radiological images between the right and the left. Okay, so, and then this was her on day of surgery uh, with her immediate load bridge. And here's her immediate load bridge. So I'm quite strict in my protocol when it comes to construction of a provisional. I don't have any uh, distal cantilever on my provisionals. They're all screw retained. So as you can see, when this lady smiles, we can see big gaps distal to the premolars. So really we need teeth all the way back. And that's why we utilized her pterygoid, a tuberosity bone and, and the pterygoid plates and placed implants there. So the definitive prosthesis would be uh, you know, sort of inclusive and, and we could uh, add in a lot more teeth. So unfortunately, just the way this webinar works, I'm not able to show you a post-op picture, but this case is finished. But what I do have is a post-op of a post-op radiological image. And what we've done, as you can see, is when it comes to the definitive, we, we, uh, utilize all six implants with a and construct the definitive what i would add is that something that you do need to be wary of when you do the prosthetics for a implants that uh, for for patients that have pterygoid implants i.e large ap spreads the prosthetics is certainly more challenging because you really need to be careful achieving the the most accurate passivity as possible on your metal framework and that can potentially be a, a challenge uh, when you have such a large ap span so that's you know there's certainly prosthetic challenges when it comes to construction of your prosthesis when you place pterygoid implants so just, please please just be aware of that so what we're going to do now is just go on to the second half of the presentation so i need to come out and then put up the second set of slides so if you just bear with me so we're going to move on to case two so this is a 64 year old gentleman again loose teeth he's got gaps and he wants to avoid a denture medically no nothing 
too much to worry about. And again, he's a non-smoker. I do tend to only treat patients that are non-smokers. Okay, so here he is. So again, high smile line. So what I must add is, although these bridges that I've delivered are FP3, and I've done a bit of an alveoplasty, what I have also done is combined the alveoplasty with lip repositioning to minimize the, the amount of uh, bone destruction that I've had to do, uh, bone removal I've had to carry out. So both these cases also had a degree of lip repositioning because they were both high smile cases. Otherwise I'd have to remove a lot of bone. And the, the, the challenge there is you, you can only remove so much bone, otherwise you're then limiting the amount of bone available to place implants. So here's some more images as we go along to move on. Okay, so planning, really important. I always plan my cases uh, and illustrate, etc. Sometimes I digitally plan but I don't use any guides or digital guides for placing pterygoids in implants. So just going to quickly run through. So flap, big flaps. Uh, this is the flap after, as you can see, I've already placed the pterygoid implants, then I move on, clean the bone after the alveoplasty, clean the sockets, I place my implants, you know, really sticking, making sure I've got a good amount of buckled bone. I use a restorative guide for all my cases to make sure that it's restoratively driven, I put the flat back, then I pick them up. I do the conversions myself, I don't have a technician on site. So this is, you know, my sort of a standard protocol for picking up the implants to then convert. This is the temporary on day of surgery. So this is the post-op and now you can see Again, I got good torque in the two pterygoid implants, so I placed multi units. It just means it's easier when you come to doing the restorative phase that there's multi units already on, so you can just take off the caps and, and pick them up, etc. And again, I've only picked up the four anterior implants for the, for the uh, provisional. But we've got a perfect AP spread and uh, really happy and you can see the sort of angulations this is what you you want in an ideal scenario uh, these sort of the way that these pterygoids are angled you do need to just be careful with your angulations especially if you're combining uh distally angled implants in the anterior maxilla with pterygoid implants that your angles and the divergence of the implants isn't too great because again, that can potentially make creating a metal framework that is passive difficult. So just be wary of that. And so you need to be kind of spot on with the prosthetic side. It's not just about uh, sticking the implant in, it really is prosthetically driven. So here you can see perfect AP spread. Okay, and this was this gentleman two weeks. Now he's finished, I finished his treatment. And here's the soft tissue healing, so really nice, thick, keratinized tissue all around all the implants, perfect AP spread, uh, and he's really happy. Unfortunately, due to this whole crisis, I couldn't get the images from the practice. This is a patient that I treated in Yorkshire, so unfortunately I don't have a post-op, but he is finished as well. So here's, so that's only the kind of two cases that I wanted to go through, I'm conscious of the time. but. I just want to illustrate a few other cases where I've utilized pterygoids and just talk through why I utilize pterygoids. So I did have some other uh, x-rays for this particular case, but unfortunately they're not showing up in the webinar. But what, if I give you some background to this case, this is an FP2 case uh, because this patient had a high smile line. It wasn't immediately loaded, but this patient had some implants that failed to integrate. So. If I just bring up the whiteboard, what we did have was we had an implant here and we had a short implant in this region. And what happened was when I came to uncover the implants and place the multi-units on, these two implants were, when I started tight, maybe 15, 20 Newton centimetres, they started to move. And at that point, at my experience level isn't where it's at today. So I just thought, oh, these have failed. And I took them out 
But in hindsight, maybe if I'd left them for another three months, maybe they would have integrated, I don't know. But what I did do was a short time after was get the patient back and I placed a pterygoid implant here. And that allowed me to minimize or not just minimize, but a, not have the need to have any kind of distal cantilever. So again, it's really useful in terms of what I didn't work, but I could go back and place a tegoid implant in and uh, minimize any any distal cantilever. So it came in really useful. Another slide here, uh, this is a really nice case that we did a few years back where we've actually utilized trans sinus a zygoma and a pterygoid. So you can use use them in combination with a lot of other different types of implants. Now, some of you may look and ask, why didn't I place a pterygoid on the right? But if you look really carefully on the right tuberosity, there's a, a donto in the tuberosity. And what we didn't want to do was, yeah. Yeah, so there's an odonto. So that uh, was the reason why we didn't place a pterygoid on the right side. Uh, but yeah, great to utilize pterygoid implants with a combination of other uh, extra maxillary implants. Another case we've, you know, in, uh, there's a, the next few cases, another real benefit for myself being able to carry out pterygoid implants is there's some cases where there's very little bone and being able to place pterygoid implants, I'm able to avoid a quad zygoma. So, Avoiding a quad zygoma, you know, it allows me to minimise the potential, uh, the potential severity of a procedure to patients. So, by utilising pterygoids and conventional and just a single zygoma, I'm able to offer full arch solutions without going the full hawk and doing a quad zygoma. And then we've got another case again. Here we've utilised. Uh, nasal palatine implant, so we enucleated the nerve, placed an implant in the midline, single zygomas each side, and then single pterygoids each side, so perfect AP spread. So, in conclusion, what I want to say is, the important thing to remember, simple surgery, complex territory. And I hope that through this presentation you've got, what is a pterygoid implant, what are the clinical situations that we'd utilise it, and some of the surgical steps involved. So placement of the implants can be challenging in the dentist's maxilla, and that's due to the bone quantity and quality. And the pterygoid, and pterygoid implants offer a solution where we can avoid grafting. And by avoiding grafting, we save time, cost, and it certainly reduces patient morbidity. You can potentially immediately load the pterygoid implants. We've got literature that supports success rates that are equivalent to conventional implants. It's a, an alternative to sinus lifts and zygomas. And certainly we have better prosthetic outcomes and there's less severe complications compared to zygomas. Okay, that's me done, guys. So I'm just going to go through some of these questions. Daniel asks, IV sedation for all these patients. Hey, guys, if I can ask if you could please complete the feedback. If you click on the link, I'd really appreciate that. So Daniel asks, IV sedation, all of these patients? No, not for pterygoids. Yes, for zygoma patients. A lip repositioning webinar. Andrew, yes, a lot of people ask about lip repositioning, but to be honest, the best way to illustrate lip repositioning in full arch, you've got to see it. Tahid's asking, is a fractured pterygoid plate felt or visualised? Both. You can feel it and visualise it. Jamie's asking, the one you lost in the sinus, did you not have a... Jamie, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have a carrier on it. Uh, you you know, that's the real risk. If you've ever heard of the Duncan-Kruger curve, uh, you know, you, you, you get overconfident at times, but sometimes you need uh, an event to bring you back. And that was that for me. So, yeah, please, please, if you ever think of doing these or do these, please put a carrier on because I was bricking it until I realised it was just in the sinus. 
a chetin, no, there's no uh, reason to do pterygoids first. I just, I like to, I suppose probably this because I like to just uh, put the local in uh, into a specific area first at the back of the mouth, a, a localised area, and then I move forward. So I suppose, yeah, it's just the way I do things, always pterygoids first. Uh, So the risk to play, but if you don't angle it, you, you, no, the risk really to the plexus is more to do with if you, you know, not uh, placing it, if you place an implant that's too, too long, but stick to 15 or 18 and you're well safe of, of, of the plexus. So Yasser's asking, where do you learn? So me and some colleagues run a cadaver courses for pterygoid and zygoma implants so that would be the best and then sometimes there's potential of a hands-on uh, i'm involved in doing hands-on training courses in brazil and that often gives a really good avenue to learn these uh, techniques on patients do you please take out implants a bit subcrestal yeah sometimes just but not so crucial uh, in in that region because the you you have such an abundance of good quality soft tissue in that region it, it's not so crucial to be subcrestal but yeah it's I, I, certainly crest level do i consent the patients for no i do not consent them for loss into infratemporal fossa i consent all patients for the potential of complications that need referral to someone else to be dealt with. So in a roundabout way, I do. Other times where you decide to sinus lift would be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Not for full arch, no. Uh, so Cassia is asking a really, really good question. These are really easy to maintain. So although I've not gone into the the prosthetic element of pterygoid implants and how they relate and how you construct the full arch bridge. What we're doing with uh, a pterygoid bridge is we don't have teeth all the way back. We've only got teeth to the sort of a six or the seven region and then there's a mer strut. So really they're self-cleansing. Yep, Lawrence. Yep, so yeah, important point. So the, 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 the BioHorizons 4.2, uh, Taper Pro and the 4.2 pterygoid implant doesn't come with a carrier, so uh, I will have to. I often uh, add a carrier on uh, before I place it. Uh, someone's asking, where do you get MUAs at 45, 60 degrees? You can source them. There's specific individual companies, Jamie. If you drop me a text, I'll give you details uh, where you can source uh, multi units that are of. A, a higher degree of angle correction. How do you control a bleed for the plexus? Uh, to be honest, thankfully never had to deal with that. There's a surgeon in South Africa, Greg Boys Varley. He talks about having a situation many, many years ago where he had a significant bleed and really that had to be dealt with Maxvax. Thankfully he is a maxillofacial surgeon and, and you know you need to tie up vessels high up. So that's not something that you can deal with just in the dental practice. Uh, could you do it? Could and would you have a limited long span bridges with three separate bridges and two posterior? Uh, so you can you can do short span bridges with pterygoid implants utilizing them. So you could place an implant in the premolar region in a pterygoid and do a short span bridge. Uh, okay, great. I think that's. Uh, Daniel, no, never use uh, any any guides for doing pterygoids. I don't use any guides for any full arch, and I rarely use it for conventional as well. Joe asks a really good question. The angulation of your placement on the model seemed very much in a straight distal read. I think that's probably just because it's a picture, but it is, you know, it, it, you, can, you can do it on 
start your osteotomy on the crest, but often the best way is just slightly buckled to the midline of the crest, angled palatally at an angulation of 45 to 50. Uh, Sheriff, by the way, thank you for all the kind comments. OHI, no, no. For full arch uh, patients with pterygoids, they get a water pick and get, they utilise super floss and X floss. No different, you know, really easy to maintain because they're all the metal strut up to the up really two degrees self cleansing. Okay. Guys, thank you so, so much. So grateful for the comments, everybody's attention. Time is valuable. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. I hope you found that useful. I have my email ad address, drferhanahamid.gmail.com. If there are any questions, please feel free to uh, drop me a message either via Facebook or my email. No problem at all. Have a great, great day. And all the best to yourselves and your family. Stay safe.